Okay, then let's talk about the purines. The next one are, are all purines really are neuromodulators. So they, they mediate the processes of communication between two different types of neurons. And what's interesting to me is how much work probably went into figuring all this information out. But ATP actually can act as a neurotransmitter as well. That's kind of weird to me. Um, either excitatory or inhibitory, depending on the receptor subtype. I imagine there's a lot of things that can bind to ATP. Um, direct or indirect action, also depending on the receptor subtype. Um, found in the basal nuclei. It induces calcium wave propagation in astrocytes. Hopefully, by the end of my lifetime, we'll know a lot more about astrocytes. And then it's also released by sensory neurons as well as injured cells to provoke a pain sensation, especially with injured cells. That's really important clinically with certain types of drug the drugs that you give when you have like a crushing injury. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but just keep that in the back of your mind. The next type of a purine is adenosine. So if we were to just look at this, this whole thing right here, that's the adenosine part of it. Um, and this is kind of a picture here showing the structure, but it's kind of a goofy looking structure. Also neuromodulator, mostly inhibitory. Um, it acts via a second messenger. And what's really interesting to me is that it's involved, they think that it might be involved, may be involved in the sleep-wake cycle. Why? Because when you take caffeine or when you drink some tea containing theophylline or chocolate with theobromide, all these things block adenosine and therefore have a, systemically speaking, have this uh, stimulatory effect. Now, um, I don't know why exactly I mentioned, I mean, I know why I mentioned it, but it's not exactly relevant to the concept of a neurotransmitter so much as it is in terms of sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system. But anyways, in people who have certain types of SVTs, so supraventricular tachycardia, so a tachycardia that exists above the ventricles, okay, uh, usually at the SA node, will give it to people. And I don't know if they still give this to us. It's been a long time since I've worked in the healthcare, but um, they'll give people adenosine whenever their heart is going crazy like this, just example. And then after adenosine, their heart will literally stop temporarily. And you might ask them to cough or something and they'll go back to being you know, a normal sinus type of rhythm there. Not the best picture I know, but anyways, um, that's how it works. And it works by opening up potassium channels, which immediately hyperpolarizes the cell and prevents them from contracting. All right, so the last ones that I wanted to mention are known as gases or they are lipid solubles. Just depends on how you want to look at it. The two of them are, and this is weird to me because I always thought that these were poisons, nitric oxide and carbon monoxide. Um, they actually are known to have an excitatory effect, usually via a second messenger, and that second messenger is usually an intracellular receptor because these guys are lipid soluble. They can diffuse through the plasma membrane and they play a large role in the central nervous system for memory formation. So if you're remembering things, you're releasing nitric oxide. <laughs> um, this increases the strength of certain types of synapses via a retrograde signaling. So what that means is, you know, you have a neuron, um, there's the uh, dendrites there, there's another um, set of um, those are actually the axon termini. There's the, another neuron body. So whenever these guys secrete neurotransmitters and they bind here, the postsynaptic cell is going to send a signal back to the other one. And that's what we mean by retrograde signaling. So it goes from a, a postsynaptic cell to the presynaptic cell, sending a signal. Now, it also causes certain types of smooth muscles to contract. Um, if you've ever talked about this right here, Viagra enhances nitric oxide. That's, that's what we're doing here. Um, and the peripheral nervous system you can find in the adrenal gland and then the nerves of the penis because of what I just talked about there. It's made on demand and it diffuses out of the cells to the target cells because it is lipid soluble. Okay. So carbon monoxide, I haven't really mentioned that, but it has a very similar, but very different pathways. So the biochemistry details of it are, are different, but also kind of similar in what's in a name really. There's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to induce these types of responses. And structurally speaking, nitric oxide and carbon monoxide are really, really similar. They're basically just like aeronucleophiles, but they're so damn toxic. I'm surprised that our brain would ever actually, you know, synthesize these compounds. Must be some very interesting reactions we have going on inside of our cells. Okay, so the last ones are known as endocannabinoids, also lipid soluble. Um, they tend to be inhibitory. They act via a second messenger. Don't know what happened to the words there. Um, involved in a lot of memory formation, appetite, neuronal development, and it actually has receptors 
found on the immune cells. No idea why. <laughs> um, we know that it affects appetite. Another form of this would be uh, THC and uh, otherwise known as the munchies, right? Neuronal development, all this stuff here. I don't really know how much we know about this stuff and how much of this is just correlation rather than an actual established mechanism. But anyways, it's formed by clipping the cell's own plasma membranes. And if you look at this, you can actually see that it kind of looks like the little fatty acid tails of a phospholipid bilayer. And so since it's obviously lipid soluble, it'll diffuse freely from the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so there's that, there's another one. So this would be the presynaptic neuron, this would be the postsynaptic neuron, like other lipid soluble uh, neurotransmitters. And it diffuses freely from the postsynaptic neuron to the receptors, G protein coupled. On the presynaptic neurons, it's a retrograde messenger that inhibits neurotransmitter release. So once this guy receives too many neurotransmitters, it's going to send endocannabinoids from here to here saying, hey man, stop sending me neurotransmitters. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about this. THC has actually recently been legalized, and I would like to see some better research. Because frankly speaking, if you Google anything about this shit, you go to imright.com for some potheads, or you go to imright.com for some people who think that weed is the devil. Um, I don't really know much about what its, its effects are because I don't know if anybody's ever been able to do really serious research with it. But now that it's being legalized, at the, at the least, regardless of where you stand on that issue, I, I hope that we can get a better understanding of how this stuff works and, and hopefully understand whether or not it's good or bad and put, put that question to rest once and for all.